What's going on, Click Squat? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy, Dub. It's your boy, Ross. And we in the clutch, baby. Hey! Back to you, ladies and gentlemen, with another video today, you feel me? We're back with another Mr. Ballin'. The Chinese Ballin'. government has confirmed the paranormal. Mm. I'm telling y'all, bro. I'm telling y'all, man. Mm. This should be mm. very interesting. Mr. Ballin is great it's with real. the... The storytelling, so I definitely want to see what he has to talk about in this particular one, man. We're gonna check this out. Shout out to everyone that's watching right now on Twitch. And if you're not subscribed to us on Twitch, the link is down below. Subscribe, man. Join in on the fun when we do these weekly live stream reactions on here, man. Don't want to miss out. <laughs> All right, bro. Just stick it here. What, bro? Miss? Oh, come on, man. All right, Cut let's do out, this, bro. Let's get into this one, man. Story. Let's go. Don't look at don't take a don't take a don't take a don't. Oh, don't sleep. Oh shit. Late on the evening of July 27, 1977, a 21-year-old farmer named Huang Yan Cho walked down a wide dusty road in the little farming village of Beigao, located in northern China. It had been a very hard day on the rice farm where Huang worked because they were all preparing for the autumn harvest. But okay. even though Huang was totally exhausted and worn down, as he walked down this road, he was whistling an upbeat tune. Because for the first time in a long time, Huang was actually excited about the future. Huang had grown up hmm. in a poor family and he hadn't even finished elementary school. Oh, wow. He still lived oh, with damn. his parents in a tiny house and basically every day of his life was the same. He got up at sunrise, he walked to work, he worked all day until he barely could even stand, Damn. and then he would walk home and he would go to bed. But the reason Huang was now feeling kind of excited about his future was because he had just gotten engaged to a beautiful girl in okay. a neighboring village, right. and their plan Wong. was to get married after the autumn harvest. Hold on, bro. Huang was already hard at work, whoa, 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 literally. Do rag perk, bro. I'll be What'd he to say? Two Wongs don't make a... Don't make a right... See, this is why, Durag, we can't make you a mod, even if we wanted to. Two Wongs don't make a right. This is why. All right, bro. All right, my this, bad. This is why. <laughs> this is, this is why, Durag, bro. Actually <laughs> building them a house that they could move into after they got married. And in fact, on this particular night, that was where Huang was going. He was going to the property where he was in the middle of building this house. And he was going there not to work on the house anymore, but really just to admire his property. Because again, he was just so excited excited about the future. Huang turned the corner and his beautiful half-constructed home came into focus. The foundation, the walls, and the ceiling were all complete. All he had left to do was put in the windows and the doors. Okay. And so Huang walked up and ran his hand over the beautiful brick he'd laid around the outside of the property. Brick was not cheap. He had worked mm. extra hours to afford this brick. And so he was just so proud of it and he ran his hand over it. And then he kind of stepped back and kind of imagined the house when it was all done. And then when he felt satisfied that he had seen enough, just kind of nodded and turned and just continued walking back towards his home, his parents' home, which was only a few minutes away. When mm. Huang got to his home, he went inside and his mom already had a meal made for him. It was okay. just some rice and veggies. And so Huang sat down and began eating and then his parents came over and they began chatting. And then of course the conversation shifted to Huang's upcoming marriage because that's basically all Huang ever wanted to talk about. Huang. And then by about 10 PM, Huang was so tired that he crawled into his bed and he fell asleep almost immediately. The next morning when Huang's parents woke up, they discovered that Huang was not in his bed. Now, this was not totally unusual because they knew their son was a really hard worker and it wasn't unusual for him to wake up really, really early to it's head to out work. to the farm to begin his work day. But a little while later, the workers at the rice farm where Huang worked, they ah, saw Huang had farm. not come to work. And because that was so out of character for him, one of the workers actually walked to Huang's parents' home to see if he was okay. And when Huang's mother found out her son had not shown up to work, you know, she was really worried, but she told this worker, oh, you know, my son must have gone to the house he's building, you know, go over there and see if he's there. But the worker from the rice farm went to Huang's property he was building and nobody was there. And so when he came back and told Huang's mother, this sent her into a total panic because really for her, this was like completely out of character for her son. He would never miss work. He would. My bad. That's, that's crazy. Whoa, why did it man, do what that? What are you doing, man? <laughs> I don't know why it did that. Well, what's, guys. What's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I 
don't know why it did that. He would never just. I was trying to point out what someone had said, bro. <laughs> Y'all are going crazy in the chat right now. Hold on, hold on. With the I Wong got... thing. Yeah, everybody's. Man, chill, bro. Ain't... Something probably happened to Wong, and. <clears throat> See, that's the thing. Durag started this, bro. <laughs> yeah. Someone said Ross pressed the Wong button. All right, bro. All right, dog. I'm sorry. Long service. This is this is this is your fault, Durag. Disappear like this. Something was wrong. So Huang's mother sent this rice farm worker to go find her husband and tell him what was going on with Huang. And then oh in the meantime, Huang's mother just walked outside and began going door to door, asking neighbors if they knew where her son was and if they wouldn't mind coming out and helping her look. Now, at this time, the village of Beigao was a relatively small place where all the residents more or less knew each other. And so it did not take long for the news of Huang being missing to spread uh -oh. all across Beigao. And the community really came out in force to go look for him. And so by the afternoon, there were people on bikes riding all around, oh, calling wow. out for Huang. People were going to neighboring villages to see if he was there. Another right. group of villagers went to Huang's fiance's home and they spoke to her and she had no idea where Huang was. And so by about the early afternoon, when so many people couldn't find any leads to where Huang had gone, it became clear that really nobody had a clue what happened to him. Now, Beigao at the time was incredibly isolated. This is a small town where most of the people who live there don't have phones, they Damn. don't have cars, they ride their bikes everywhere, and there were no roads that connected Beigao to any other place. Now, there was a paved road that went through Beigao, but it actually just came to an end on the outskirts of Beigao. So there was just no way to go Secluded, to other places, man. at least not efficiently. Basically, if you lived in Beigao at the time, there was a finite number of places you could go. And all these people that had gone out looking for Huang had searched all of those places, and Huang just was not there. And they discovered he said his they bike looking was in still the leaning up places. against his parents' house. And his work clothes, which he wore basically every single day, were still folded up neatly inside of his room. And so wherever Huang was, he was on foot and he was still in his pajamas. That night, Huang's parents would contact the village committee, which was basically like the governing body for Bei Gao. And the village committee decided that this was serious enough because again, they're thinking, this is impossible, where is this guy? that they decided to contact the police. But when the police got this call, they did not launch an investigation right away because they had limited resources and there was no sign of foul play here. It was very weird that Huang was missing, but he was an adult and if you wanted- Something is seriously wrong, bro, y'all gotta stop, bro. Appreciate the subscription. Appreciate the subscription and the, and the, uh, <laughs> and the bits. <clears throat> y'all gotta stop. This story is heading to a dark place. I can tell, and y'all not making it in any better with these Wong jokes. This is heading down the wrong path, okay? You wanted to say that, didn't you? You got it out, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> to go vanish somewhere. And it's it Huang. Like, okay, you know, you're Wong. an adult. You can do that. And so Huang's family and the like, rest of the quit. Big Al villagers were forced to just kind of wait and see if Huang came back. Appreciate but the over the next few days, Huang did not come back, and there was still no new information about That's what wild. happened to him. Early on the morning of August 5th, so eight mm. days after Huang went missing, and still by eight. this point, there's no sign of him, the deputy director of the Beigao Village Committee came running up the road to Huang's parents' house and knocked on the door. Oh, when the boy. door opened up, it was Huang's father, and the deputy director handed him a telegram he had just gotten and said, read it. And so Huang's father took the telegram and began reading it. And as he did, his eyes went wide. And then when he was done, he looked up and he was just so confused. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Nice cutaway there. Uh-oh. Last weekend, I asked old Seiko! <laughs> hold on, bro, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why you skip that, bro? Look at that entertainment. I didn't skip it, I paused it. What the fuck was that? Come on, bro, I'm interested to see what's gonna happen. Wait, hold on, wait, wait. And then when he was done, say no. <laughs> what do you wanted to snack on for our Super Bowl Fifty Eight watch party? <laughs> hey, that was so out of character <laughs> for him. <laughs> this nigga, no. what the fuck was that? I thought this was a different person, and they did a voice change or something. Oh, for real, bro, uh, bro, this nigga here, this nigga wielding coconut crabs. No, 
But did it get us jacked up about Super Bowl 58? Wow! Yes, it did. And so once this again, this year, we are partnering up with DraftKings to make sure all you fans of the Strange Dark right, and Mysterious out there get access. Oh, he did all that for the DraftKings. So what is it, bro? Took a park. <laughs> <laughs> You said, oh, you want this ad to be exciting? Oh, I got you. Hey, that caught oh, me off guard, bro. Man, I was not expecting that Because he was such in him. a deep, like, tone and just uh, so mellow. Wong balling. <laughs> Come on. Y'all niggas. Oh, my God. I was not expecting that, bro. Oh, my God. Then they come God. back with the music. Yeah, the series. The telegram had been sent eight days earlier at around 9 a.m. on July 28th. So basically, right around the time that Huang's family discovered Huang was missing was when this telegram was sent. But for whatever reason, the telegram had been very delayed. And so they were just receiving this telegram now, eight days later. And the contents of this telegram made no sense. It said that just nine hours after Huang had fallen asleep in his parents' home, he was discovered lying on the sidewalk in the middle of this bustling city called Nanjing, located 600 miles to the south of Beigao. Now, what? the reason Huang's father and the deputy director were so confused by this telegram was this was impossible. Remember, Juan does not have a car, so yeah. the only way he could get around was on foot or on his bike, and we know he left his bike by his house, so he's on foot and very likely in his pajamas, and what, he's gonna go 600 miles? I mean, even if he walked the 30 miles to the nearest train station, nine hours, because that's how much time it took from falling asleep to being discovered in the city, is not enough time to go the remaining 570 miles to Nanjing. So yeah. Wang's father and the deputy director, they talked about this and they both decided that, you know, this just can't be true. Clearly somebody has mistaken some other person for Huang because he cannot possibly be all the way in Nanjing. Now, this telegram said that Huang was being held in a deportation center in Shanghai. And so Huang's father and the deputy director decided they would That's send wild. the telegram back to the sender at this deportation center and tell them, hey, if this really is Huang, he should have a very specific birthmark on his wrist. And so when they sent this telegram off, they fully expected to get one back that said, oh, our mistake, you know, it wasn't him. But they got a reply relatively quickly and it said, oh yeah, he's got that exact birthmark. It's definitely Huang, but he's very confused. He doesn't really know what's going on. And so somebody from your village has to go get him. Huang arrived back home in the middle of August. So about two weeks after he had gone missing. Damn. As soon as he got there, his fiance and his parents were so happy to see him. And pretty soon, a steady stream of friends and neighbors and other family members began coming to Huang's house to talk to him, to hear his story, to hear about what happened. But Huang really didn't understand what had happened to him. And so mostly he just didn't answer any questions he got asked. He just kind of kept his head down and just kept saying, you know, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And then really when his family pressed him and said, you know, like, you got to tell us, you know, this is so crazy. What happened? He would say, look, like, I'm going to tell you what happened, but I don't even know if I can believe the things I'm going to tell you. And so Huang would say, uh -oh. you know, all he could remember was he went to bed in his own bed in Beigao. And then the next morning he woke up and he was laying on the sidewalk. And when he opened his eyes, he saw there was this big swimming pool and then near it was a sign that said Nanjing. And so that was how he put together that he was in Nanjing. And then almost immediately, these two police officers wearing all white just kind of appeared out of nowhere. And they walked up to Huang, they scooped him up. And without really saying anything to him, they brought him to that deportation center in Shanghai, which is a place where people who seem confused or mentally ill would be sent in order to help them get home and that was it that was huang's entire story that he just basically woke up in nanjing with no idea how nah, that's wild there. bro and so after <laughs> he told his family they all just kind of looked at him like really like that's what happened that makes no sense but Huang, I mean, he was completely lucid. He was explaining it really specifically and really simply. I mean, he looked and sounded exactly like he normally did. And he seemed very honest as he was telling the story. Over the next few weeks, Huang kind of reintegrated back into his life. But things just were not the same. People yeah, were now I scared bet. of him. I mean, kids literally ran. Huang teleportation spell.
they've been doing this for the old Yeah, people. I've been seeing it. Wong vacation. Wong, Wong. Oh my Wong God. Wong Uber. Wong person. <laughs> Y'all Wong. Ran away from Wong him lived when they the saw king. him because rumors were going around town that he himself, his body, was haunted or something. And so kids were scared of him and other villagers would openly gossip about him right in front of him. I mean, That's how small that village is. Wong from Marvel. <laughs> Come he on, just, bro. He just, the little... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wong from Marvel, he used the fucking tongue. The Wong little... Chi. <laughs> Y'all stupid, bro. Oh my god. <clears throat> Oh, 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 oh my god. And his beloved fiance admitted to feeling really uncomfortable around him. Oh, and while all of this was obviously not the very fiance. upsetting for Huang, damn. he did also understand why people were acting this way. I mean, this is a very anomalous thing that's happened to him, and he did not oh, have strange. a good explanation yeah. for this totally insane event that he was a part of. And so he just kind of got it. And in fact, Huang himself was kind of terrified of himself. I mean, at night when he would go to bed, he would be terrified that the second he closed his eyes, he was going to be transported hundreds or thousands of miles away yeah, to yeah. some totally unknown place. And maybe this time he wouldn't even be able to get back again. But as the days wore on, Huang continued to wake up in his own bed in Beigao, wow. which over time kind of made him feel more secure that whatever happened to him was a one-time thing and it's not going to happen again. However, famous last words. However. <laughs> It'll never happen However, again. However, where do he I get, get that from? Transported into the hood of America. <laughs> oh, no, that's that's really scary. Hey, yo, where you been? Ah! Hey, yo, where you from? <laughs> where your mama stay? Where your grandma stay? Right, where your bro, daddy stay? Clearly, I'm not from here. Huang would be wrong. On September oh, 8th, 1977, damn. so three weeks after Huang had returned back home went to sleep in his bed in the village of Beigao, but when he woke up the next morning, he was not there. Oh, the first thing Huang noticed when he woke up wild. that morning <clears throat> were the sounds around him were totally different. They were not oh. right. Normally, when he was asleep in his home, he would hear the sound of his mother and father snoring right by him, oh, oh. and he might hear some insects or birds out his window. And those sounds were gone. Instead, he heard what sounded like footsteps, but not ordinary footsteps. They were footsteps of somebody walking on cement who was wearing high heels, like a clicking sound. And then Huang also became aware of the fact that his face was clearly pressed up against cement. He was laying on the ground, but Huang couldn't open his eyes. As hard as he tried, he couldn't do it. He couldn't move his body. And so he's just laying there on cement with his eyes closed, listening to the sound of these footsteps, these high heels, getting closer and closer and closer. And as they did, his anxiety was growing and growing. He had no no idea who this person was and then these footsteps they got right up to him and then passed by him and Huang felt the breeze as this person walked right past him and then after this person in high heels had kind of walked off in the other direction Huang finally was able to wrench open his eyes and he sat up and he looked around and one he couldn't find anybody it was totally abandoned all around him so whoever had those high heels on had somehow vanished in plain sight mm -hmm. and then also as Huang continued to look around him it looked like he was in the middle of this city but again there's nobody out there it's like this abandoned city street all he had in front of him was this clock up on a building that said 1 a.m and so pretty soon huang was just kind of walking in circles screaming out for help and right when he was about to just start sprinting in any one direction in hope that help would be somewhere out there Huang felt a tap on his shoulder. And then the person tapping him from behind him said, are you Huang Yan Cho? Huang spun around and he saw there were these two men in military uniforms standing there. And for a second, Huang felt relieved. Somebody was here to help him. But then he thought to himself, how do they know my name? What's going on here? And so he asked them, how do you know my name? But the two men didn't answer Huang. Instead, they told him that he was at a Shanghai railway station 700 miles from Beigao, and that they, these two soldiers, were here to take Huang to a nearby army base. At this point, Huang was so scared, he just didn't know what to do. So he just wound up going with these two soldiers who put him in the back of a jeep and then they hopped in and began driving and they drove him out of this weird Something abandoned city where he had woken up 
And after driving for some time, they arrived at this huge army base that had all these rows of fencing around it with razor wire on top and all these sentries that guarded all the doors. And these two soldiers brought him through several of these checkpoints. And then when they reached the very last one, they stopped the car, they got out, Huang got out too. And the two soldiers that were with him grabbed Huang's shoulders and they basically led him through the last checkpoint, which was manned by armed guards. And as Huang was led through this gate, the armed guards seemed to not even notice these soldiers or Huang. It was like they were invisible to the armed guards. But either way, they got through the final checkpoint and then the two soldiers that were carrying Huang led him to this kind of nondescript big building and they opened up a door and they began walking down this long hallway that kind of zigged and zagged. It was like a maze of different directions you could go. And then finally, they brought Huang right to this big door that said division headquarters over it. And then before Huang could say anything, one of the two soldiers that was with him knocked on the door. And then before anybody could respond, that same soldier reached down, opened it up, swung the door in, and then they pushed Huang inside and they stepped in after him and shut the door behind them. In front of Huang was this big desk and sitting behind this desk was a very senior looking military official wearing a uniform. And this official, when they looked up and saw Huang standing there, they got up to their feet and put their hands on their gun and said, what are you doing here? How'd you get in here? And Huang, sensing there was something wrong, threw his hands up to show he was not a threat and pointed behind him and said, they brought me here. And the military official, who still had his hand on his gun, looked behind Huang and said, who brought you here? And Huang, uh oh, uh, bro, I knew it was coming. I knew so the who. Did this nigga get powers? Dog. And how the fuck did he get through the checkpoint? Fam. This military. But official? that's the thing. The dudes that was carrying him in there apparently wasn't who he thought they were. Because mind you, when he was in the city, nobody was around him. And they picked him up. They tapped on his shoulder when he was about to sprint off. And they grabbed him and brought him to that location. And he did say when he went through one of the checkpoints that the guys, the military guys that was standing in the front was looking as if they didn't see them. What the hell is going I, on this here, shit. bro? Wild, fam. What the fuck's going on, bro? He turned around and he saw the two soldiers who had picked him up and driven him here and led him to this room they were gone, which was impossible because Huang would have heard them leave. He didn't hear anything. The door never opened. They just somehow were gone. A second later, the senior military official had pulled out his radio and he was screaming commands. And then another second later, armed soldiers came running into the room. That's... They grabbed Huang, who still had his hands up. They came in, they arrested Huang, and they began asking him all these questions about how he got in here. How did you get through the guards? Did you yeah. climb the fence? Did you cut the fence? Yeah. How did you get in here? It's not possible that you are here right now. But Huang did not have any answers. All he could say was, the two soldiers, they brought me here. A couple of days later, Huang would be bussed back to Beigao. Yes. And again, his friends and family and everybody in town had all these uh, questions yeah. about- Huang gotta happened. go at that point. Again, Huang just had no answers. And then just 11 days after coming back home the second time, Huang would disappear again. And this time he would tell people- Bro, what the hell is this nigga? Hey, bro. <laughs> I don't know what to say about this one. This nigga keep disappearing and ending up in random places. What Miles type of- Miles away. Bro, what type of superpower does this nigga got, bro? What is this? He don't well, know his power. He encountered two men who told him they were the same two men from the other two times he had gone missing. You had the first instance where he woke up and two police officers in white picked him up off the ground and brought him to the deportation center. And then the second time was the military base where you had those two soldiers who brought him through the gates and brought him to division headquarters. Basically, these two men he encountered on the third trip were saying they were the same men across all three instances. And on this third instance that he went missing, Huang said these two men put him on their backs and they flew him to nine different cities around China for reasons unknown. And then they flew him back to Beigao. Wait, so they just... All right, bro, get on our shoulders, Wong. <laughs> Wong, Wong needs to pay attention to who he... Once you said flew... Butterfly in the sky. I can fly twice as high. <laughs> Hell no, nah, bro. Once you said flu. I think you're on a reading rainbow trip. 
or the never ending story. I don't I know. Say what Wong the... drugs. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, hop on our shoulders and let's go. We he flew you to nine different cities bro, for, for somebody, reasons unknown. On somebody's shoulders. Nah, bro. Something wrong there. That don't make no fucking sense. That's a long ass flight, unless this instant. Unless they mu they must have been. It hey. gotta be instant, bro, because I ain't about to be just sitting on someone's shoulders for fucking hours. Being hey, flown bro. around. <laughs> <laughs> being being fl he was flewed out. He was flewed out on a nigga's shoulder. <laughs> Just they dropped him off right outside his house near a tree, and that was it. Now, of course, this final Wait, go back. disappearance sounds the most absurd oh, because man. across all three instances. And on this <laughs> third instance that he went this? missing, Huang said these two men put him on their backs <laughs> and they flew him to nine different cities around China for reasons unknown. And then they flew him back to Beigao and just dropped him off right outside his house near a tree. And that was it. Now, of I'm course, trying. this final disappearance sounds the most absurd because what? He was flying on the backs of people to all these different cities? That doesn't make any sense. But when Huang was kind of aggressively questioned about this third story, because it sounded the most made up as compared to the other two, it would turn out Huang had all this kind of insider information about each of the nine cities that he supposedly was flown to by these two men. He knew the weather in each of those cities on the night that he was gone. Oh. He knew what shows were playing on the night he was gone. And he also just had really specific descriptions of where he was in each of these cities when they got there that all checked out. Now, you got to remember that getting that information correct would have been really hard for Huang at the time. He did not have internet access. He didn't have a phone. He didn't have a car. I mean, he lives in an isolated small village in rural China. So the idea that literally the morning after all this happens, he's flown to these different cities, that he would have all this information perfectly correct, that's hard to do. That would yeah. be hard to lie about. As of today, no one has ever been able to debunk Huang's stories. Mm. Basically, there's enough legitimacy and verifiable information in his stories that you really can't discount them. They really could have happened. Add in the fact that Huang actually took a lie detector test and passed it, and suddenly you're looking at a story that, as crazy as it sounds, really could have happened. And so Huang's story today is considered far and away the most famous UFO story in China's history. Because the leading theory here is that Huang must have been abducted by aliens, and that's how he was being moved around all these places. But, but, but why, though? Those two men that kept showing up in each... Huang was the chosen one. Right. <laughs> the chosen Huang. I... Somebody said Huang abduction. <laughs> these events were the extraterrestrials that had scooped him up. Nobody knows, but that is the theory. As for Huang, he wishes none of this had ever happened because his disappearances and whatever happened to him basically wrecked his life. His fiance broke up with him because she was so uh, uncomfortable around him and there was a lot of stigma around Huang, especially damn. in the village where everybody thought he was a liar. And then on top of that, all these news and film and TV crews came to the village because they wanted to shoot shows and documentaries about Huang and Huang did not want anything to do with them. But again, like all these people are coming to the village for Huang and it's making the rest of the villagers upset. And damn. then also there was a really lengthy investigation by the police and mm -hmm. by the military to try to figure out how in the world Huang got into that army base. I mean, there were layers and layers of security that he somehow got through, and all those armed guards that were watching the gates said they never saw Huang walk through, even though Huang said he literally just walked through the gate yes. with the two soldiers right. that were carrying him through. And so today, Huang actually still lives in Beigao. Wow. He had a son and a daughter, and he has grandkids, okay. but he refuses to talk about what happened to him because, again, it wrecked his life. Damn, bro. Holy, man. That so was th wild, bro. That was... That was wild as hell, fam. That was super wild, bro. I like, I couldn't imagine, bro. Like, Damn. So, basically, this nigga goes to sleep, and these aliens or whatever they are, they say, you know what? We're going to choose this Wong, and then we just going to take this thing on a... We're just going to take fun. it on a trip. First, we're gonna do 600 miles. We'll, we'll, we'll see how he gets adjusted. We'll test it. Yeah, and then we'll send them back.
Next time, let's do it like nine hundred, a thousand miles, and and let's let's really like show him what we can. Yeah, but let's really show him what we can do. We can get him inside a base. He won't even know what's gonna hit him. And then the third, we're gonna put this nigga on our back, and we're gonna travel all across the country. Just Some let this nigga home. know, hey, we really out here. <laughs> we like, really, no. we really them on the. We cool, really man. them, bro. What the? You never got flued out like this before. Bro, <laughs> them niggas was like, hey, come on, bro. We got you. <laughs> to nine different cities, bro. Wong had to, like, he said they was an all white. Bro, and the fact that they got this nigga in a, a, a military base and this nigga pops up. Hey, hey what, what, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing in here? How did you? How did you <laughs> the two dudes back. The two. Now, I'm not crazy. Was, so if it was us of this complexion, oh, oh yeah, you would have got popped. As soon as we in that base, it would have been, hey, <laughs> bow. Which is kind of fucked up because they threw him in there yeah. and then they disappeared. So whatever they did to get him through the first sets of clearance, they must have made him like invisible or something. Yeah, or something. they put a goddamn invisibility cloak on him. <laughs> and then they threw him in there with the general and then took the cloak off and then disappeared. Facts, that that was kind of messed up, bro. They, that they is. Messed with Wong, bro. Damn, bro. Wong just an innocent bystander. This nigga just wants to build his house. He wants to marry his girl and, and just live the simple life he was living. And the next thing you know, this nigga is being transported to different locations by two fucking foreign creatures for no apparent reason that we still don't know of. Is it safe to say he was at the wrong place at the wrong time? Yeah. <laughs> but hey, if y'all enjoyed the video, uh, make sure you run up the likes, subscribe, let us know what else we be checking out, man. Keep on supporting us. Spreading love, being loved. They, they were crazy in the comments, bro. Uh, yeah, make sure you join the, the Twitch chat. if you can, bro. Yeah, in the chat, they was, they was crazy. So we love you guys. Continue to spread love, be love. <laughs> we'll catch you in the next one. Peace out. Already. If this is from Houston, if you got a problem, then we got the solutions. And there's no illusion. I made this shit happen, I'm living life lucid. I'm switching my strategies. Now they hate on me cause I'm causing casualties. But why are they after me? Deep inside they know they can't handle half of me.